glad you're here and not at the lake. <laughs> I'm Jane Williamson, I'm the director here. Um, and we're going to have a program this afternoon that you're really going to love. Um, first of all, a lot of our programming for this year um, is partly a credit to Anne Verplank. Anne and I first met at a conference of Quaker historians and archivists more than a decade ago. We were two non-friends on the same panel, and we were talking about material culture, and afterwards we just bonded and have been in touch ever since about our research, um, our interest in Quaker-made things. Um, so Anne is a real one of the leading scholars and a really nice person. She gave me lots of tips on, you know, when I was trying to figure out the programs, she spent time with me on the phone, which has really been very helpful. So um, she's going to talk today about um, Quaker Aesthetics, uh, which is the title of a book that she co-edited that is a wonderful book. And I'm sorry, we don't have the book in our gift shop. It's, it's a fairly expensive scholarly book, and I, we don't usually sell too many of those. But it's readily available online. And I recommend it. It's a fabulous book. Um, so in the book, there are, are specific articles. Like our exhibit this year is about furniture. There's research on dress, meeting houses, all these different aspects of Quaker life. But Anne is going to give us sort of a broader overview of um, Quaker aesthetics. Um, so we're crowded in here again, um, as we were for our last program. So I will just say when we're finished, when Anne is finished and you have finished asking questions, um, we do have some refreshments for folks who want to hang around and chat some more, but you're going to have to sort of stand up and fold up your chair. <laughs> um, it's really funny because before we built this building, this building just opened three years ago, we used to do these programs in a parlor of the house. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this. We were just jammed into this room. So we're not supposed to be jammed, but here we are, jammed again. <laughs> and it was the same thing. People just knew that automatically you had to get up and put your chair, otherwise there was no room to walk. So, um, and I also want to do my two little commercials. One is become a member of Rugby Museum, please. There are, uh, this is what they look like, envelopes at the desk. And if you don't have one already, please take a calendar. We do have several more wonderful events coming. Yep, they're there over there. They're also at the desk. Um, this is the first of the, of the ones that go with our uh, Quaker exhibit, but our Pine Ice Cream Social is coming up in two weeks. So if those of you who've been to that before know it can't be beat, it's homemade pie, right? Um, okay, so, and. First, I wanted to thank Jane and her colleagues here at Rokeby. Um, this is really a gem and a place that's tied quite meaningfully to the community in a number of ways, um, with a very important collection. And it's a great site for thinking about the past and the present in interesting ways. And I should add, um, I have this habit of either whispering or putting my foot in my mouth because somebody can hear me 40 feet away. So if you can't hear me, just wave, let me know that I'm back in the mumbling mode. Um, the title of my talk, Quakers in Plainness, Is There a Quaker Aesthetic? sets us up to talk about something very abstract and perhaps a bit technical. It won't be. And if we could have the next slide. Um, what I'd like to do is briefly talk about Quakers' possessions and a bit about architecture um, so that we can think about Quakers and, as importantly, others' ideas about Quaker plainness. We'll need to remember that official guidelines about Quakers' behavior, and there's a great example in the exhibit there blown up, um, were subject to interpretation. And to complicate things a bit, we'll want to think about wealth and geography, individuals' devoutness, and other factors. So in some, Quakers were individuals affected by those around them, both Quakers and non-Quakers. Thus, Quakers in Philadelphia, those in rural areas surrounding the city, and those in Vermont behaved quite differently. And our ideas about Quakers are also shaped by comments made during the time and, as importantly, later. These ideas set us up to think about our expectations of Quakers in the 1800s. I'll also touch on how much Quakers varied in their dress and behavior and possessions, 
And I'll also discuss how Quakers and other activities in the 1900s have shaped how we perceive Quakers in the 1800s. So, next slide. So, these photos of Quaker meeting houses near Adams, Massachusetts, and Media, Pennsylvania, remind us that Quaker architecture is one of the most public and permanent manifestations of the Quaker faith. To this day, viewing a meeting house and the landscape around it shape our ideas of Quaker life. So we need to think about these cultural landscapes over time and remember that preserving meeting houses was an activity that allowed some Quakers to reaffirm past practices, like collecting family belongings and papers, uh, building pre preservation was also related to the broader historic movements in the 1800s and 1900s. Um, Quakers' choices of what to collect um, and preserve uh, shape our perceptions of individual places. And if we could go to the next one. I should add that meeting houses are far more dominant and concentrated in the mid-Atlantic than in New England. Um, though this is an image of New York. And trust me, it was the best I could find. Um, thus, buildings are part of why the mid-Atlantic, particularly around Philadelphia, was perceived as Quaker long after Quaker economic and political power waned. But I'm not going to focus much on meeting houses and other public structures, except to note that they are a very public um, manifestation of the faith and thus shape our ideas. Um, Catherine Lavoie, who will um, be here on September 11th, is an, except, is an expert on Quaker meeting houses and architecture generally, and she'll speak a great deal more on this subject. If we're ready for that, okay. So where, does, where do, does, does the perception of Quakers as plain come from? Some objects made and saved by Quakers, such as this silk quilt, meet many of our assumptions about plainness and simplicity. So you see the muted colors that some associate with Quaker plainness, but also the high quality silk fabric. So it fits a lot of our stereotypes about Quakers. Um, this quilt with riotous colors also has a Quaker history and challenges our assumptions about Quaker practices in the 1800s. So these two quilts are both from the Philadelphia area. Um, and I should quickly add that we can't use the orthodox Hicksite split, which I'll come to in a minute, um, to explain their differences. The orthodox Hicksite split occurred in 1827 and 1828. Um, though problems had been um, building uh, since the 18-teens. The split, which separated Quaker communities and even families into factions based on doctrinal stances, lasted well into the 1900s. Those who know Quaker history will wonder whether Hicksite Quakers, generally more conservative in terms of doctrine, uh, less worldly, and often uh, living in a more rural place, chose plainer possessions? The simple answer is no. Um, but Quaker choices about possessions did vary with time and place, intensity of belief, and one's age. So what did Quakers say about possessions? In the 1800s, Quakers received guidance from the London Yearly Meeting and developed their own guidelines. In the written rules of discipline, again, a picture of one in the exhibit, of the Philadelphia and New York yearly meetings, Vermont Quakers, um, I should add, were part of the New York yearly meeting. Quakers limited their references to material life to repeating earlier advice regarding plainness, plainness and caution against uh, the wearing of fashionable clothing. Everybody. Although the rules of discipline do not mention specifics, friends address their concerns about simplicity and plainness outside of the Quaker meeting as well as within it. And I've got a handful of quotes, and some of them are a little long, but they're really good, so I'll, I'll give them to you. 
Quaker mores about material life appear to have been conveyed through general practice and individuals written and presumably oral remarks. Friends rarely wrote about possessions, either in official documents or in correspondence. A rare comment um, is Philadelphia area Quaker Margaret Morris's admonitions to her granddaughter, written about 1810, which um, urged plainness and restraint. And you'll see that she says, I entreat thee, my dear, not to aim at a high living, uh, living in a high style. Be content to live in a plain, frugal manner, agreeable to the way in which thou hast been brought up. I entreat thee not to launch into extravagances in dress. It shows a weak and vain mind to be continually changing one's dress as the fashion changes. So note that she wants her granddaughter to mostly socialize with other Quakers. I wish thee to confine thy acquaintance chiefly amongst friends of our own society. This is not an uncharitable wish, but springs from a fear lest thy young and tender mind should be drawn into the uh, into a snare and tempted to imitate the vain and foolish fashions of the world. So evidence of customs and of purchase and use lies in the possessions themselves and in their relation to individual friends' writings such as this. Um, next one. Um, there we go. Um, Abby Hopper Gibbons, who you see right here in later years, um, uh, wrote uh, about 20 years later. And again, this is a different place, New York, um, and a, a quite different individual. She writes, I like simplicity. I never yet felt the least disposition to wear gay colors of any kind, or trimming, or ornamental work. I acknowledge I'm a little particular about the cut of a garment. Our tastes differ and we cannot all agree as to what is most becoming. Therefore, everyone is to his liking. So we see how two Quaker families discuss dress and behavior and also infer differences between Quakers and the broader population in this type of warning. So during the 1700s and 1800s, Philadelphia's Quaker community remains separate from, yet intricately connected with, the larger population. And I use them as an example again because the, the data is so concentrated there. Although subject to the same laws as men and women of other faiths, members of the Society of Friends also had their own rules. Some written, others understood, some enforced, others flexible, to guide their behavior. Through the mid-1700s, Quakers had a strong political and religious influence in Pennsylvania. Their power then declined. And the American Revolution tested many Quakers' beliefs and practices. So large numbers of Quakers withdrew or were expelled from the sect for participating in the revolution. And, oh, sorry. this is perfect. No, no, perfect. That's in. Uh, the church one is perfect. Uh, if, yeah, thank you. Um, so in the decades that followed the revolution, um, some friends chose other faiths that did not exert such strong pressure on individuals' business practices, um, accumulation of possessions, or marriage outside their faith. Those that remained Quakers formed close circles of kinship and friendship and community um, that were distinct from yet part of the broader population. Many Quakers continued to use material possessions, particularly clothing, to outwardly separate themselves from non-Quakers. In 1839, a visitor to Philadelphia noted, um, and who was a non-Quaker, the Quakers, who were still among those who directly or indirectly influenced the fashions of society, have introduced a patrician simplicity in dress, manners, and habits, which forms a singular contrast with the gaudy, ostentatious display of wealth with which, with which one is occasionally struck in New York. Um, Grund goes on to add that Quaker women dress plainly, but in the richest materials, showing that their aristocracy consists in substance, not forms. 
The color of their dresses, which is usually of a light gray, is not ill-suited to a fair complexion. But the cut is too old English not to form a glaring contrast with the Paris fashions weakly imported into the United States. So thus, in 1839, Quakers very much stood out in Philadelphia. Um, and I think we've got another, okay, there we go. And again, sorry for the long quote, but it's just so great. Um, Quakers didn't always conform to stereotypes. Um, Elizabeth Willing, um, who was a Philadelphia area Episcopalian, wrote in 1824, and she talks about the Quaker style doesn't altogether please me, and I can account for having momentarily adopted it because she was um, going to visit um, a, a group of Quakers. She, we jumped at the idea of witnessing for the first time a regular stiff ceremonial Quaker tea party um, and set off in our plainest attire, uh, resolved to be on our best behavior and um, consoling ourselves with the idea that if we should not laugh at the party, at least we would laugh heartily upon our return home. <laughs> um, so it really gets at that idea of otherness and making fun of Quakers. And the joke was on her. Upon entering the room, we expected to have found a circle still more formal, um, and we would look at straight plain caps and broad hemmed cambric muslin dresses, and we were looking for Quaker bows in snuff-colored uh, squared tail coats. The Quaker tea party was not a Quaker tea party. Uh, there was not a single Quaker Quakeress excepting that of the family. Um, so it, it's really a great story about what their expectations were. Um, and for the next one, um, Willing further uh, adds that the invitation was extended using language associated with Quakers, thee and thy, and so on. And that Judge Hopkinson wore a worn, bepowdered blue coat. Um, so Quaker beliefs uh, were. Uh, as well as their behavior and possessions, were noticed, they were challenged, and clearly sometimes mocked. Um, but they didn't always conform to outsider stereotypes. So here we have the Robinsons. Um, uh, advertisements, friends, correspondence, like the ones I've, I've um, noted, sewing manuals, and sometimes satirical newspaper stories discuss the limited co uh, color palettes and specific garment cuts of Quakers in Philadelphia and elsewhere. And looking at surviving garments, Aaron Eisenbarth, who will speak here on September 25th, um, has found that by about, um, the, about the 1850s, Friends clothing was slightly plainer in color and cut than non-Quakers. So this fits with a broader idea that in terms of both ideas and outward appearance, there were fewer differences between Quakers and others after about 1850. Now this varied with time and place, and my sense is Workby um, is one, one exception where, um, but um, friends' choices in behavior and dress uh, were highly varied and individualized, and thus they're not uniformly distinct from non-Quakers, and, and they change over time. And it also comes back to this idea of about, about um, individuals' ideas about their faith and how they want to be expressing it through things like clothing. So furniture owned or made by Quakers, and you've got wonderful examples uh, next door, um, doesn't always conform to our stereotypes. On the left is a mahogany chest made by uh, William Savory, who was a Philadelphia Quaker, for Joseph Wharton about 1770. And it's very similar to furniture owned by non-Quaker Philadelphians at the time. And is one of those objects that really t helps us with the idea that our ideas about plainness were different than um, Quakers' ideas in the 1700s. Then we have um, Vermont cabinet maker, Stephen Foster Stevens, um, uh, chest on the right. And um, he was in a rural place, and um, this was made considerably later than the high chest, but nonetheless forms as good a comparison as I, I can try to make. But clearly, plainness mattered much more here in rural Vermont. 
um, in his monthly meeting uh, in Ferrisburg, numerous Quakers, as Jane has written about, uh, were disowned for departing from Plagueis. <coughs> in Philadelphia era meetings, on the other hand, Quakers rarely mentioned infractions regarding Plagueis. So he, um, Stevens provides a really good example of how Quakers' behavior varied um, with location in terms of selection of objects. Oh, there we go. Oh, um, what about art? Um, Quakers and art is a really tricky subject. Most Quakers, not all, avoided having oil portraits and miniatures, um, and miniatures are these watercolor on ivory um, images that are about this big. Um, but a few Quakers did have them done, and when they had their oil portraits or miniatures painted, Quakers' portraits generally don't um, look much different from those of non-Quakers. Okay. Uh, most Quakers in Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley who had their portraits done in the early 1800s chose silhouettes. Um, and as I'm finding, as I'm beginning to look at New England, which was in part related to um, preparing for this lecture, um, there are a lot of silhouettes of Quakers in New England as well. Even the most well-to-do urban Quakers who could easily afford more expensive portraits chose silhouettes. Why? Uh, the Quakers did not discuss their choices. Um, we believe that these portraits met unspoken ideas about plainness. And what I um, am particularly intrigued by are some albums that well-to-do Quakers assembled um, such as the one, um, you see the outside here and the inside here. And I found about 15 of these all together. Um, silhouettes were popular in the late 1700s and early 1800s, in part because of a widely held belief um, that a person's character could be read from his or her facial features. And this circulated again in the late 1700s. Silhouettes didn't require long sittings and probably required um, no appointment. They could be done on the spur of the moment. They were also inexpensive and they could be done in multiples. Um, the result was several identical, identical images that could be given or exchanged, kept loose, framed, or put in albums. At Peel's Museum, um, a wide range of artists cut silhouettes um, and others passed through the city and essentially silhouettes were easy to get in Philadelphia. Um, here at Peel's Museum, they were generally cut from one piece of paper that had been folded and then folded again, so you had multiples of four. There were several ways to make them. Um, there we go. Um, Peel had a physiognomy trace, and you have a sketch of it on the left, um, sent from England, and he, um, the sitter's head was traced, sort of like this, as one was put one's ear against here, um, sorry, against here, and it essentially created a smaller version, um, not unlike some of the writing machines that were done at the same time that are, uh, allowed copies to be made of um, documents. So. Um, the impression or outline uh, when this was made, um, usually on a, about a three inch by four inch piece of paper, was then cut out. Um, it was often then placed on dark paper or fabric background. And um, these silhouettes are colloquially known as hollow cut silhouettes. Um, one could also trace a head directly from a shadow or cut a silhouette freehand, such as this one of Sylvia Hathaway from New Bedford. And, oh, there we go, that's perfect. Um, uh, I should add that uh, New England was a major center for silhouettes, aside from what Quakers were doing. First, itinerant uh, cutters traveled through New England, cutting many middle-class sitters who wanted inexpensive portraits. And we're, next one, there we go. Um, second, numerous silhouettes and even one silhouette album survive from the Quaker stronghold of New Bedford, Massachusetts, and environs. Okay. Um, in Philadelphia, the presence of profilized Moses Williams and his successors at Peel's Museum that meant Quakers, uh, meant that Quakers and others had relatively easy access to silhouettes beginning in 1803. 
So whether you were in a rural area, whether you were in a city, really pretty easy to get one done. Um, but silhouettes were neither marketed to Quakers nor commissioned solely by them, whether in Philadelphia or New England. Rather, friends were drawn to the medium uh, because its physical qualities meant largely unspoken um, ideas about plainness and perhaps individual standards of economy. So, so some friends used them in very specific ways. Um, women in at least 15, I've just seen a 16th um, uh, album, um, largely of prominent, wealthy, urban Quakers uh, had these albums done. Most were from Philadelphia, some Baltimore, New York. These were, women were from families who held positions of leadership within their faith. Most of the albums were assembled, assembled in the 18-teens and 20s, often from silhouettes done a decade or more before. The person who compiled the album could provide order to the relationships and how one viewed and remembered individuals. So the activities of assembling, adding to, and viewing the albums are as important to my mind as the albums themselves. Commissioning and exchanging silhouettes, as well as assembling and viewing them in albums, reinforced family and community ties among um, Quakers between about 1800 and 1840, a time of crisis for many friends, as we've talked about, um, loss of Quaker political power and the um, uh, Hicksite Orthodox split. Um, so let's take a look at, oh, there we go, You're brilliant, um, at the silhouettes that Quaker prefer, Quakers preferred. What them, made them not just acceptable but desirable for Quakers? They're made of relatively inexpensive um, and, red, and easily available materials, paper, uh, which is very different, say, from the uh, miniature here, which is watercolor on ivory and um, this is a metal case that was often um, had a, a gold wash over it. So very expensive, very time consuming. Um, and the type of thing that was popular with equally wealthy but non-Quaker Philadelphians. So the, the um, you, oh, sorry, oh sorry. go ahead. That's okay. Um, the use of a physiognomy trace meant that silhouettes um, had relatively little variation among images and limited reliance upon an artist's interpretation. So this um, was a simple black and white image rather than a colorful, elaborate one. And we're now ready for the Robinsons. Um, in 1839, when photographic images became available in this country, most Quakers and others quickly embraced daguerreotypes and later amber types. Um, these were singular images. There were no negatives. Um, in Philadelphia and New York, strong ties among Quakers and amateur and professional scientists encouraged interest in daguerreotypes. Um, there and in cities and towns, this medium became really popular for, for many people. Quakers, though, seem to have had a special affinity for the medium. In a probably fictional article, um, uh, in a Godey's Ladies book, you know, widely read across the country, um, it, but Philadelphia based, T.S. Arthur notes in 1849, even the somber friend um, who heretofore rejected all the vanities of portrait taking is tempted to sit in the operator's chair and quick as though his features are caught and fixed by a, a sunbeam. Among friends, it is well known that there had existed a prejudice against having portraits taken. To some extent, this is wearing off, and very many prominent members of the society have, of late years, consented to sit for their likenesses. And in Daguerrean galleries, a goodly number of plain coats and caps may be seen among the specimens. But large numbers still hold out and will not be tempted to enter a painter's studio or daguerreotypist's room. So uh, T.S. Arthur's remarks um, could reinforce readers' perceptions and even stereotypes of the differences between Quakers and the rest of the population. Though um, publishing in Godey's Ladies book, um, he commuted, communicated his interpretation of Quaker practices um, in Philadelphia to the periodical's national readership. 
And um, Arthur, like Grun, the man I noted earlier who spoke in 1839, um, he doesn't distinguish Hicksite or Orthodox Quakers in his remarks. And although the branches of the sect remained quite distinct um, in the 1840s and 50s, um, in terms of this facet of material life, uh, self-representation -repre through daguerreotypes, Hicksite and Orthodox friends rarely are distinguishable. And, okay. Um, looking at Quaker's daguerreotypes, including comparing them with non-Quaker selections, um, we see that there are, were a range of choices of attributes um, among Quakers, um, but their portraits <coughs> fall within the more restrained end of the spectrum. Size, case type, embellishment, elaborateness of poses, costumes, and coloration generally reflect the more modest options available. Hicksite versus orthodox stances do not appear to have affected portrait choices. And we're ready for the next one. Um, however, in Philadelphia, the generally more worldly orthodox Quakers tended to um, patronize the more prominent galleries and made slightly, and I mean marginally, uh, less restrained choices than their Hicksite counterparts. And right, next. Okay. Uh, by embracing the novel medium of daguerreotypy, many well-to-do friends reinforce their interest in science as well as forward-looking strategies, such as the willing to, uh, willingness to invest in new technologies, such as railroads, or a desire to employ innovative business tactics. So um, they were looking at a new medium. At the same time, they were more than willing to look at progressive ways of uh, ensuring their economic success. Uh, here we go. Um, I'm one of these people who got obsessed by cases, whether it was for portrait miniatures or for daguerreotypes. Um, so I, I looked at cases as well as what was inside them. Philadelphia area friends' choices in daguerrean portraiture and their options for presentation of these portraits in a wide selection of cases varied also with branch, devoutness, age, worldliness. And here we go. Um, in instances where Quakers chose a more elaborate case, the case was a smaller one. Or conversely, a larger daguerreotype of a Quaker tends to be housed in a relatively simple case. There we go. Uh, younger Quakers apparently had slightly more latitude in their portrait choices. And their daguerreotypes, such as these two, indicate that um, their clothing um, was as varied as that of their non-Quaker peers. And we have um, two uh, women who are related, um, these extended families. These are an incredible cache of uh, daguerreotypes and ambrotypes at Swarthmore College. And um, so we have this very, very plain one. And then we have a young woman with a traditional background. And though she's wearing a plain-ish dress, she, she could be a non-Quaker if we didn't know who she was. And here we go. Uh, older or more devout friends, on the other hand, sometimes signaled their stances by having themselves daguerreotyped in distinctly Quaker apparel. And here we go. And um, it's also worth remembering that Quakers and non-Quakers patronize the same studios where the broader daguerreotype-seeking population was exposed to Quakers' choices in apparel and pose and coloring and vice versa. At Wren's Gallery um, in 1856, at least one Quaker daguerreotype, that of Lucretia Mott, and this is uh, from a different gallery, um, was displayed for all to see. Um, and it may have looked something like this one. So daguerreotype studios in Philadelphia did a number of things. They um, had images displayed of sort of popular uh, icons like Tom Thumb. They also um, had some, some studios had um, anti-slavery uh, anti stances, um, some had anti-temperance stances and would be displaying individuals related to those stances. Um, and one wonders if that was the case with Wren's uh, studio. So they were a site of, daguerreotype studios were a site of interaction among Quakers and non-Quakers, Hicksite and Orthodox Quakers, local residents and those from out of town. 
In some, their aesthetic choices in daguerreotypes follow patterns in other media. They made a variety of choices, again, wealth, devoutness, and age. Um, there was a huge variety in their choices, but very subtle differences um, in, in, uh, by, things, by factors like age or um, devoutness. And uh, there we, go. Um, we have also have T.S. Arthur, a non-Quaker's remark, caught and fixed by a sunbeam rather than captured by an artist's hand, um, providing one of the few documents, other than the photographic images themselves, that tell us why Quakers embrace the daguerreotype for their portraits. <coughs> On to um, notice I, I can't I can't not do um, uh, Edward Hicks. Um, no discussion of Quakers and art would be complete without him. Um, he was the cousin of Elias Hicks, who led what came to be known as the Hicksite separation. And uh, Edward Hicks was not surprisingly a Hicksite Quaker, and um, different in outlook than many of the urban Quakers we've we've seen. Um, and indeed, the Quaker meeting in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where he resided, was more concerned with reading people out of meeting for infractions related to possessions than, play, than um, those, in, um, those meetings in Philadelphia. He started as a sign painter and is best known for the 60-some Peaceable Kingdom paintings he did in the, from the 1820s to the 1850s. Uh, many of his paintings refer to the Orthodox Hicksite split. Um, one can interpret um, this the way Carolyn Weekly has done, um, including looking at how the animal's expressions change over time. And one can also look at the widening gap, and it varies from painting to painting um, over time. And if one chooses to, one can read that as the Orthodox Hicksite split. Um, so. Uh, he was doing more utilitarian painting for the most part, or this religious painting. So we're on to the next. Um, and he did almost no portraits. Um, so many have suggested that his focus on religious topics, landscapes, and utilitarian work like sign painting was related to his faith. His memoirs help us a bit, but neither he nor the Quaker meetings of, in which he was a part make really explicit statements about art. So as a, with our discussion about daguerreotypes, we're largely left with the evidence provided the, by the art itself. Um, and we know that Edward Hicks picked certain topics, avoided others like portraiture, and imbued many of his paintings with references to, to and he, perhaps even interpretations of Quaker events. So another type of evidence, um, as I sort of begin to, to, to finish up, um, that helps us understand Quaker aesthetics um, is the revival of interest in Quaker's past in the late 1800s. Um, Quaker's interest in the past, uh, specifically their past, was tied in part to the movement broadly known as the colonial revival in the 1870s and onward. And I should add that Quakers and others started looking backward well before the centennial of 1876, but uh, interest in the nation's history really blossomed about that time. Oh, there we go. Um, two activities in the late 1800s and early 1900s helped shape our ideas about, uh, about Quakers, preserving old Quaker meeting houses and creating new meeting houses that included traditional elements. For friends, older meeting houses were historic structures, spaces for meeting um, and worship, and templates for new structures. Perhaps most important, meeting houses provided a tangible reminder of Quakers' roles in developing the region in which they lived, whether it was Philadelphia, whether it was Vermont. Quaker meetings with their buildings from the 1700s and 1800s, cemeteries, and often open spaces around them serve as some of the most prominent reminders of a region's past and exemplars of friends' public preservation impulses. Various meetings celebrated their centennials or even bicentennials around the turn of the 20th century. Um, Marion, Pennsylvania, 1895, Medford, New Jersey, 1914, to name but two. And they also created publications to mark these events. 
In a preface to Arch Street Meetings, 1904 centennial, Isaac Sharples noted, it is well occasionally to look backward into the past and gather up the standards and principles of our ancestors in the faith. So in addition to preserving meeting houses, some meetings built structures that made explicit references to historic buildings. In the 1920s and 30s, architect Walter Price, who was a Quaker, uh, designed several meetings, including ones in Washington, Montclair, New Jersey, and we could do that, um, and uh, at West Town School outside of Philadelphia. Price strongly invoked past architectural styles in his meeting house work and his language about these commissions. Plans survive for Price's renovations uh, to Art Street, London Grove, and Haddonfield meetings. Um, and I should add that though he was a Quaker, he was he would do um, he would do a wide range of commissions, both for Quakers and non-Quakers. And we're on to Scipio. Yes. Okay. Pro Walter Price had been sketching interiors of Friends meeting houses since at least 1893, so 25 years before he's doing these buildings. In 1894, he went to England to look at a meeting house there. And here I show you a sketch of Birmingham meeting in southeastern Pennsylvania and an etching of um, Scipio um, meeting um, uh, in Cayuga County, New York. So Price was looking at historic meeting houses and sketching their layout and design elements, uh, such as benches. I got obsessed by benches um, early in his career. There we go. Um, Buckingham Friends Meeting is one of the oldest meeting houses in the region and, according to Catherine Lavoie, was a model for other 18th century meeting houses in America. It and other older meeting houses had an impact upon Price. Regarding early American ones, including Buckingham, Price noted in 1936, the mechanic had wood shingles and used them to reach the utmost simplicity in the meeting houses without ornaments, but well proportioned. So that my, is my definition for this old colonial at its simplest. In another essay, he decries that no images survive of Chester meeting, uh, again outside of Philadelphia, in its original state noting that in 1883 the building was thoroughly modernized. That means thoroughly spoiled. <laughs> um, and we're all on to Montclair. So I'd suggest that Walter Price, by building Quaker meeting houses in a traditional style, helped promulgate a Quaker aesthetic that made deep references to the past. He chose to create a double plan meeting house, uh, one that had gone out of favor uh, for decades. Uh, it's also worth noting that the Montclair meeting, established in 1925, was the first meeting that rejoined Hicksite and Orthodox members. So here we have a very traditional meeting house form for an unusually progressive congregation. Um, here I show you some comparisons of Buckingham and Montclair um, on the exterior. We've got the date stones, uh, where are the date stones? Here and here. And then we've got the overhangs, two examples here and one um, over, circled over there. Um, so he was taking um, elements from a, from a number of older meetings. On to the next one. Okay. Um, so there, some of the elements are worth um, mentioning um, in the interior of Montclair. We have fireplaces. Again, 1925, we really don't need them. Um, for heating that weren't necessary for heating, as well as pocket doors. And um, there are, so there are a huge number of historic elements in both the interior and exterior. And then here we have the benches about which I obsess. Uh, <laughs> so here's a, com a comparison of benches in, in older meetings um, and one of Price's sketches of these and the reproductions, for lack of a better word, of the ones he designed. Um, that, that he was he was uh, drawing on older meeting houses uh, for the way the benches in his newer meeting houses should look. So Walter Price incorporated traditional design features on the exterior as well as the interior of meeting houses. By creating new meeting houses with historic roots, he helped institute 
or perpetuate the idea of places such as Montclair as historically Quaker. Yet we know that his other structures, whether for Quaker or non-Quaker clients, made little or no reference to Quakerism and the simplicity sometimes associated with it. Um, and Price was but one person involved in creating or preserving meeting houses. But each commission um, involved numerous members of a given meeting, and his commissions were widely dispersed. This suggests first that the connection between Quakers' pursuit of their history and the broader Quaker revival movement was part of what was going on. And second, these meeting houses speak to individ individual meetings' interest in continuing to create and preserve uh, architectural aesthetics in a changing world. As the country was looking backward in the late 1800s and early 1900s, in the face of rapid industrialization and urbanization, so too did Quakers. For both secular and religious reasons, many sought a purer time. Some Quakers, particularly Wilburite friends, older Hicksites, and ministers, chose to codify their religious beliefs by wearing plain or old-fashioned clothing. Later generations of friends collected and saved and sometimes modified this clothing, valuing it as a material manifestation of their heritage. This 1888 photo by Gilbert Cope, recording um, many generations of the Sharples family, or one branch of the Sharples family, family, underscores an interest in family history. Note the old-fashioned clothing, um, particularly on the older women, um, and you know, here are some examples here. Um, and um, by having their photographs taken in this clothing, they recorded one version of the past and the present for future decades. Other Quaker clothing and photographs of it in the late 1800s and early 1900s help perpetuate our ideas of Quaker plainness. Here we go. Um, here you see images of Quakers, particularly older ones, wearing old-fashioned clothing and in some cases mm -hmm. celebrating the past by wearing historic clothing, for example, right there. Um, the image on the right was taken at the opening of the Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College, and I'm not sure of the occasion on the left at Husuk meeting. So I show these photos taken in the early decades of the 1900s to make several concluding points. First, um, the photographs ask um, us as viewers and, and participants to look back um, to a seemingly purer time in Quaker and American history. Um, we've talked about saving and collecting practices among Quakers. Um, and one thing I didn't mention, which probably is familiar to most of you, uh, Quakers seem unusually um, adept at uh, saving materials. And there's, in some historical collections, there's a disproportionate amount of Quaker material saved because there was such interest in it. Um, we've also talked about how our modern idea of this, of ideas about plainness don't always conform to historic ones, and think of that Philadelphia Quaker high chest. And also about how ideas about plainness varied among Quakers in the 1700s and 1800s. And perhaps the starkest difference is a place like Philadelphia and Ferrisburg, Vermont. Um, though many communities in between shared um, ideas about plainness. So um, these photos, like the other images you've seen, suggest that collecting and saving practices shape our ideas of what Quakers did. Last, the photos remind us of the range of behavior and choices of possessions made by Quakers over two centuries. Thank you. <laughs>